you have your Bibles, turn with me to the gospel according to Luke, Luke chapter 15. The word of God says in verse 1, Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. I read verse 8 again. Suppose a woman who has ten silver coins and loses one. The title of our message for today is, You Lost Me. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for entrusting us in your presence right now. We ask for your spirit to continue to move throughout this sanctuary. And more importantly, our hearts as we decide to be vulnerable to you, to hear your word and be transformed by it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, amen, amen and amen. You lost me. You lost me. You lost me. It's actually kind of a part of our vernacular today, you know? Now you, just, you lost me on that one, bro. You, you lost me on that. Sometimes they'll say it this way. You, you better miss me on that. You better miss me on that. This idea that, that, that God in this parable is being represented by the woman who lost a coin is a little bit unsettling. Now, can I highlight just for, just for a hot second that this is one of just four parables where Jesus has a woman at the center of it? This is one of four parables in all of the Gospels where a woman is the main character. Except in this particular parable, a woman loses something. And God is represented by this woman in the parable, and she loses the coin. Now, last week we talked about the sheep that got lost, and we talked about how these sheep are a little bit mentally challenged, and, uh, and how important it is for them to have a shepherd to lead them, right? Well, the sheep clearly loses itself, loses its way, and the shepherd must go out and find it. But in this next parable, the coin has no choice. The coin has no ability to choose. The coin is not alive. The misplacement of the coin is squarely on the shoulders of the woman. Now, a week ago during our children's story, there was a, a lot of children that confessed about things that they lost and how they felt about those things that they lost. There were uh, Nintendo Switches that were lost, right? There were toys that were lost, you know, favorite trinkets that were lost. And we can think about some of the things in our lives that were lost. I remember as a child losing things. And I'm telling you, it would, I mean, my heart was crushed. It was crushed. You, it was like someone had abandoned me. When there's a precious toy that you have, a, a precious possession that you have. Of course, many of you, you get older and... You, you're more mature, and it's relationships where you might lose someone. You lose their love. You lose their affection, their adoration, and, and, and that feels like abandonment. Here in this story, the woman who represents God loses one of her coins, one of a ten set. Now, we're not sure exactly what these ten coins are are supposed to be. Some have suggested it's a, power, a part of her wedding dowry, that this was like having a, a wedding ring. I, I know, uh, old school Avenus, a wedding watch. Right? So this was very significant to her. This represented her, her fidelity, her commitment. This represented, this represented her, her love for her, her husband and his love for her. This is, this is, what, this is what was paid in order to, to even secure the right to be able to marry her. So it was of great value. Some would say it's not that profound, that it's simply money and that she needs to make ends meet. And she could not afford to lose, not even one coin. Some of y'all know what that's like. I know not everybody in this church, but I, 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 had, I had a couple of, uh, 
uh, times in my life where my mom, being a single parent, although we had a community, a village that helped raise us, aunts and uncles and grandparents, my father was a Vietnam veteran, and there was a time in his life that he was not able to be as present. And I remember there were times that the lights were not on and we used candles. There were times then we would have to uh, heat up the water. Uh, we had electricity and we could heat up the water, but we didn't have gas. So we could heat up the water in, in, a, in a pot, an electric uh, pot, and we would have to fill up the bathtub that way. And we had to reuse that water because mom wasn't going to heat up that many uh, uh, buckets of water. And so there, there were those kind of situations where we were reliant on people's compassion and kindness to help get us through. There were those times when it was just beans and rice the entire week. So maybe this is what the woman's story was. This money was precious to her because this is the way that she was able to feed her children. But I don't want us to get past what is so absolutely critical in the details of this story. It starts off by letting us know that the woman lost the coin. It's her fault. Some would say she needs to be more careful. Some would say she needs to be more responsible. Some would say she needs to be more attentive. Some would say that she needs to value that which she has. But if the woman is to represent the father, represent God in this parable, my question to you is this. How did God lose us? How did God lose us? In our scripture responsive reading today, we read in, in Psalms that God knew us before we were born. Before we ever said a word, he, before the words were on our tongue that he already knew. That he formed us in our mother's womb. Our, our days were foreordained. He saw them before they were ever lived. This idea of the foreknowledge of God has always been perplexing in the church, especially for those who actually have left the church because of this teaching. It is very difficult to embrace a God that you believe is all loving, but allows the worst things to happen, knowing they're going to happen, and has you born into them anyway. Our daughter, who was a part of the foster care system. We brought her into our home when she was 16, told me straight up from the very beginning, I don't believe in God. So if you're going to try to read scripture and pray every single night, I'm letting you know I'm already out. I said, that's fine. You don't, you don't have to believe in him to, to be in our home. And as time went on, she would entrust with me why she did not believe in God. And she says, I cannot believe that God, knowing what I was going to go through, would allow me to be born. For Jessica, that is not just her unique story. That's many people's story. How many of you entered into a marriage that you believed was ordained by God? You knew it was your storybook ending only to end up in divorce, and then you have to question, God, why would you have blessed that? Why would you have led me in that direction? Why would you have answered my prayers in the way that you did if you knew how the story was going to end? It's very difficult. It's very difficult. In fact, Jesus even says something along the lines when he's speaking about Judas. It would have been better for him had he not even been what? Born. That's, that's from Jesus' own lips. So the question I have to ask here is if God, if you're omniscient, all-knowing, how can you fix your hands to craft Adam and then pull Eve from his side when you know this relationship is going to end in divorce? I can go back even a step further. How could you create the covering cherub in Ezekiel 28 knowing that his heart would eventually swell up with pride and arrogance? I'm sorry. I'm going to be real with you right now. I put that on God. I put it on him. Because if I were God, I wouldn't have created Lucifer. I would have said, you know what? <laughs> this is a little too much power, a little too much glory. This is a little too much shine for him. You know what? He's too perfect. I, I, need to, I, need to just, I need to bring him down a rung. I need to bring him down a notch. You see, when you are, I'm in L.A. country, right? I'm, I'm in Laker country here. Um, Derek Fisher never was tempted to think he could be Kobe Bryant. You know that, right? Derek Fisher would never think he could ever be Michael Jordan. Derek Fisher knew his role. If you don't know who Derek Fisher is, study it in the book of Ecclesiastes. <laughs> Derek Fisher 
Derek Fisher was a point guard on the Lakers. I mean, people didn't even think he should be drafted. He wasn't very skillful. He wasn't very athletic, but he was a smart player. He knew his role. He played his role to perfection and helped lead the Lakers to three championships. But this is what you have to understand. There was no mistaking who he was on that team, the role that he played on that team. Derek Fisher would never think he could be as good as Michael Jordan. But Kobe Bryant, do you think he thought he could be as good as Michael Jordan? Absolutely. Why? His skills were comparable. In fact, sometimes you could watch my, uh, Kobe Bryant on the court and, and you would mistake him for Michael Jordan. The moves were so similar. You see, if you don't want any hint of temptation, if you don't want anyone to struggle with their godlike complex, do not create a Kobe Bryant. Just create Derek Fishers, and you'll be just fine. But no, God being MJ, Michael Jesus, wants to create a Kobe. That's on God. Now watch this. That experiment blows up in God's face to the tune that one-third of heaven follows Lucifer out of heaven. One-third. One-third. And God is now creating the planet Earth in chapter 1 of Genesis. And God says, let us create man in our image. Whoa, 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 hey, whoa. Time out, time out, time out, time out, time out on the court. Wait a second. Remember how this ended up in heaven? No, 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 no. No more likeness stuff, okay? Let's cut this, okay? It didn't work out with the Kobe Bryant experiment. You're not going to create LeBron James now. You're not about to create man in your likeness and then give them dominion over the earth? Time out, time out, time out. You see, if God didn't really want mess, he should have stopped with squirrels and giraffes. No problem there. This is why people like dogs so much, right? It's so simple. You know if you feed them, they'll love you, and that's it. They're faithful. They're going to be there unless you let them off the leash. They'll probably run away. But the point is, they're very predictable, and people love the predictability of dogs. Cats, not so predictable, right? That's why people don't like cats as much. I know there's cat people out there. I'm, I'm a cat person and a dog person. I'm a, I'm a hybrid in that sense. But, but some people don't like cats because cats are unpredictable. You can feed them, and they still might not love you. You can pet them, you can, you can groom them, all this kind of stuff, and they will sometimes pretend you do not exist. I know, we grew up with cats in our household. We had one cat that was afraid of us for the entire life. Their entire life they were afraid, and we called him bashful, and he was bashful the entire life. Like 10 years with this cat, and he would still run away from us. My point is simply this. If you know what the potential risks are, and those risks can lead to destruction and death and a lot of hurt, why create? Some have said it this way, God creates because he wanted to be worshipped. I'm sorry, that's arrogant. You're willing to put all of us at risk because you simply need to hear praise songs? I got issue with that. So I know you guys feel like I'm backing God in a corner, and you know I'm probably going to get in trouble and get struck down by lightning. But I'm just being honest with you, and I know some of you had the same questions and the same concerns. God, it seems like, sets us up for failure. Because if I asked you this question right now, when he puts the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden, did he think Adam and Eve were going to pass the test? Because of how you see God's foreknowledge, all of you are going to say, he knew they were going to fail. Then why is it a test? If you know I'm going to fail, why the test? Well, there's the universe that, no, see, stop it. I am not a pawn in your game. Don't play with my heart like that. Don't set me up for failure. In fact, when, when we had Nathan, we had all these protections in place so that he couldn't harm himself. There were outlets that were covered. Cupboards that were, that were locked and not even I could get into them. 
We were trying to protect him from harming himself, right? And you do the same thing. None of you are going to give your six-year-old the keys to the car and say, I trust you, do not touch. You're not going to put, cert- put them in certain situations of risk. So here is God allowing Adam and Eve to live in a wonderful garden, beautiful, and watch this, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil that they're not supposed to touch is not tucked away in the corner somewhere covered by cobwebs. No, it's in the middle of the garden right next to the beautiful tree of life. Every time they went to the tree of life to eat, they could see the tree of knowledge of good and evil with all of its attractive fruit out there. Talk about temptation. Right? God doesn't even cover up the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He wants the attractive fruit to be seen. And here's what makes it worse. His opponent in heaven that walked out with one-third of his angels is now a tenant in the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Every time they went to the tree of life and ate, they could talk to their neighbor. Hey, neighbor. Hey, how you guys doing? You look great. Eve, you're beautiful. You're beautiful, girl. They could talk to him. And I know it appears like the first time they had a conversation is what's recorded in Genesis 3. But I know, listen, if you know anything about the subtle, crafty enemy of ours, he don't, he don't, just, he don't just begin and end it with one conversation. He starts off slow. Little by little, increments, he starts to nudge you over to the left or to the right. And so he took his time. I imagine he got to know his neighbors quite well to the point that when he says, I'm going to keep it real with you. I used to live in heaven, but God is a hater. He's a hater. He kicked me out because I began to question things. He kicked me out because he was afraid I was becoming as good as he is. He kicked me out, he kicked me out because the, my stats were starting to look better than his stats. Before you know it, Eve and Adam, they give their trust and their allegiance over to the serpent. But again, I'm questioning here, God, you lost me. You lost me. And then after Adam and Eve make the decision that they make, according to Romans chapter 5, all of us have fallen. All of us have been born into sin, born and shaped in iniquity. All of us are leaning in the wrong direction. I'm, you heard the storyteller. Sister Smith said it. We're born pretty much already lost. So God, you lost me. And now you're going to make it seem like it's my fault that I'm lost? I didn't choose to be born into this world. I didn't choose, I didn't choose the parents that I have. I didn't choose the circumstances in which I was born. I didn't choose my socioeconomic situation. I didn't choose to be a part of a family that has no generational wealth. I have disadvantages all over the place. Lord, you lost me. And many times in Scripture, it is Job, it is Moses, it is Abraham. Many times in Scripture, you have prophets, you have disciples who are crying out in some kind of way, God, your fault, you lost me. Is it God's fault, family? What's the alternative? If you want to find out the answer, we, must, we have to look at the alternative. What's the alternative? If God didn't want to create creatures in his own image, in his own likeness, what's the alternative? If you don't want people that have choice, people that have freedom, what's the alternative? Robots. Robots. But robots aren't going to disobey you. Robots are never going to choose to hurt you. Robots are going to do exactly as they are programmed. Does anybody feel loved by robots? Does anybody feel any kind of mutual admiration with robots? In fact, can I get a little deeper? In fact, even in our marriages, even in our marriages, if our spouse believes that we're doing something only because they asked, we still got issues. Ladies, you know how you can be sometimes. <laughs> You're only doing that because I, I complained about it. And I'm thinking, well, hey, I'm doing what you asked me to do because I love you. Oh, because you love me. You should want to do this. <laughs> right? We would never be satisfied with somebody doing something because they're programmed to do it. 
We want to know that it comes from their heart. We want to know that it, that it emanates from them. We want to know it is their deepest desire. And that is why we enter into these relationships. Because I'm telling you right now, buy a dog, more simple. Less drama. And you know this already. But you will not have reciprocation. You will not have likeness. Bone of your bone, flesh of your flesh. You will miss what God intended us to experience. And that is reflection, authentic reflection. And that's why we continue to get married. That's the reason why we continue to, to get into relationships. You know good and well every single relationship you get in, you risk someone cheating on you. You risk heartbreak. But yet you willingly go down that road again. Yep, here's my number. Call me when you have time. Right? Fellas, you're, you're, just, you're just still doing it. Hey, I had a really good time. Um, hey, maybe sometime next week, can we, can we do it again? Right? You don't get the response quick enough. Hey, don't want to bug you. Just want to make sure you got my last text. Is this the right number? You're already sabotaging yourself, but you can't help it. Because love is intoxicating the, 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 the idea that someone could care for you the way that you care for them. And so you willingly get into these relationships knowing good and well, you're probably going to hurt me. But yes, I'll go out with you. You're probably going to let me down. I do. Right? I do. I'm marrying a couple this, this weekend. I had premarital uh, counseling with them and I listened to their concerns and stuff like that. And, of course, they're happy and they're excited. And every couple that I counsel with before I marry them, I, I get to see all the happy stuff, right? But I always have to let them know, listen, there's going to come a time when you will be bored with one another. There's going to come a time when you're going to think you made the wrong decision. There's going to come a time in your relationship where you may have a desire for somebody else. And what I want to be able to do in these sessions is prepare your hearts for these moments and give you the tools so that when these days come, you know how to navigate through them. And that you'll realize thinking that you made the wrong decision is just part of being human in a broken world. That's just what it is. And you would come to that place no matter who you were with. Many of you, if you were married with Jesus, would say, did I make the right decision? And he's perfect. The reason why we keep putting ourselves in these situations is that we were created in the likeness of God. And watch this. Love is worth the risk for us. To be loved is worth the risk. Why have children? My son comes up to me today. I'm singing. I'm loving the worship experience. He comes up to me. He, he grabs my arm. He's yanking on it. And I said, what's, what's what? Can I have your phone? What? What do you mean you want my phone for? I'm worshiping. What are you doing? Why aren't you worshiping? I'm bored. Wait, wait, bored? No, no, sit, sing. So I'm starting to sing again. He's on my arm again. Yes, son. Can I go to your office and get your mints? What? Why do you want my mints right now? Seriously? And I'm actually having a reaction with him, right? I am going to go through this experience. You think that having my son born into the house that he would be raised and just love Jesus because his daddy does? And I knew this was a possibility. I knew it. I knew it. My son may very well grow up and say, I don't believe in any of this stuff. Dad, you're whack. What you preach about is whack. And I don't want to have to do with any, deal with any of it. That's a risk. And yet we still decided to have him. Why? It's worth the risk. Love is worth the risk. The idea that we could be with someone in our image and then together we could create somebody in our image is so powerful. We are compelled to do it. It is actually in our nature to do it. And when God is love, the Bible tells us God is love, and when God who is love creates, he creates an environment where love can exist. And the only environment where love can actually exist is an environment where there is true choice. 
If there is no choice, there is no love. Are you hearing me? If there is no choice, there is no love. In order for God to be love and for him to have a universe that is in love, right, a universe that can love, choice has to be present. Here's the problem. If you allow choice, you allow room for sin. So what should God do? Love is who he is. Love puts us at risk, but love is who God is. The question we have to ask ourselves, is love worth it? In this parable, the woman loses the coin. The responsibility is hers alone. But what you need to understand, when God created us, he created us knowing that he would take responsible, responsibility for the fall. That's why in Genesis chapter 3, when he tells Adam and Eve what's going to happen as a result of them making the choice that they made, he, he embeds in the prophetic message that there would be someone, a seed that would be sent that would crush the serpent's head. Even at the very beginning, when sin enters this world, God makes certain that they understand he's going to fix it. This woman takes responsibility for losing the coin. And the Bible says that she lights a lamp. She lights a lamp. The Bible tells us in Psalm 109 that, that God's word is a lamp into our what? A lamp into our feet. It lights our path. God's word has always been light. When we are lost, God sends his word in order for us to be found. His word is to light our places of darkness, our ignorance, our fears. This is why, this is why we stay in the word. It is to light up our situation so that we are aware, that we know what's going on. Can I get a little deeper than that? Not only is God's word a light until our feet, but God's word is Jesus Christ himself. According to John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And through the Word, all things were created. Verse 14 says, and this Word became flesh, and you know this Word. He is the light of all the earth, the light for all mankind. He is drawing us back to the Father. Jesus, the Word of God, Jesus, the Word that became flesh, Jesus is the light of the world. Somebody say amen on that one. And when God wants to light the lamp to find us, he doesn't just send us any old lamp. He sends us the best representation of who he is, according to Hebrews chapter 1. He sends us his only begotten son, John 3, 16. Jesus, who is the perfect radiance, the perfect embodiment, the perfect represent representation of God. Jesus is the lamp. And when Jesus shows up on planet Earth, he begins to light everything up. God takes responsibility for losing us. Again, you can be upset that God would, God would put us at such great risk in the first place. But if you're going to be upset with God, you need to be upset with yourself because you do the same thing. You still keep falling in love. You still keep getting married. You still keep having children. You still think it's worth the risk. You are still, like it or not, like God. And like God, you also will take responsibility. When your, when your children are hurting, you put in the work and you do whatever it takes to find them, to reach their hearts, to mend their wounds. At least you ought to. Jesus is reasoning with them. He's rationalizing with them. He's letting the people that he's speaking to, the audience that's upset that he's working with outcasts and ministering to, to tax collectors, he's reasoning with them of the lowest common denominator. He says, man, wouldn't even a woman among you do this? This is basic stuff. Wouldn't a shepherd who loses one sheep go and go find that one lost sheep? What Christ is acknowledging that this is also in our DNA family. It is in our DNA. Now watch this, watch this. As God has taken responsibility for losing us, understanding our perspective, right, of losing us, we ought to also take responsibility for losing folk in the church. Parents, I know this is going to hurt you, but some of your kids, some of your grandkids who aren't here, it's not just because television was so intoxicating. Sometimes you simply just misrepresented God. And they didn't want to have anything to do with him, 
Because if you were anything like he was, they didn't want any part of it. And I know that hurts your feelings, but that is a serious responsibility that all of us have. <clears throat> As Christ is the light for the whole world, we are also called to be lights. Didn't he say that? Let your light so shine. Don't hide it under, I used to always say hide it under a bush. Oh no, but it's a bushel, right? As a kid, I said hide it under a bush. I'm like, why would you hide a light under a bush? It would catch on fire. That's not, not even wisdom there. But we don't hide it under a bowl. We don't, we don't cover it up. We are to be lights as Christ was a light. We are also a lamp that God uses to find lost coins. It's my responsibility to connect with my son. It's my responsibility to make sure that, that he can engage in a way that's relevant to him. It's not his responsibility to work through all of the boredom. Sometimes we need to do a better job in how we communicate. And just because somebody might like the way I particularly communicate, if my son is not feeling it, then I need to make sure in our personal time that he can connect with it. That's my responsibility. We have to be lights, as Christ Jesus was the lamp. It also says that she sweeps the house and she searches carefully until she finds it. I love this. She searches carefully and does her best, and if she doesn't find it, oh well. No, she searches carefully. She sweeps the home. She does whatever it takes until she finds it. What did we say last week? No one who is lost will remain lost. God will find every lost soul. Amen? Even for you, we're saying, Pastor, but my children have been gone for so long or my spouse has been gone for so long. God is going to make certain to find every lost soul. Now, if in the end, someone who was once lost decides no longer, make, again, makes the choice to no longer remain with God, that's their choice. But they're not choosing to remain lost. They've already been found. They're choosing to no longer remain. That's a difference. That's, that, that, that's, that, that's for another sermon. The point I'm simply wanting to make here is that many of us have given up searching because it's too difficult. Grandparents, don't you get tired of trying to reach out to your grandchildren. Oh, but pastor, they don't want to go to church. Well, okay, well then you're not taking them to church. But can you call them up and just simply say, Grandma was thinking about you. I love you. Is there anything that I can do special for you this week? Pastor, I am too old for that. They need to call me and check on me. I know. I got you. I got you. Listen, I used to be guilted into that. My grandparents, my aunts and uncles used to always get on us. We were like seven, eight years old. They're calling us up. Why haven't you called us? I'm seven. You should still be calling me. But we were trained at a very young age to, to call our elders, check on them to make sure they were okay. But I'm telling you, in this story, it's not the child that is searching for a parent. It's not the little one searching for something that's lost. It's the adult in the household that is taking responsibility. If you are the mature one, the more spiritually mature one, take it on your shoulders. It's your responsibility. Find the lost coin. Be a light. Whatever that light looks like, be a light. She sweeps it. The house until she, until she finds it. She searches carefully until she finds it. This is our responsibility as a church. Not just internally, our, our family members, but also the community at large. It is our responsibility as God's people, as his church, to diligently search for lost souls. Listen, coins don't know they're lost. They don't. But you know, so you search. But pastor, they don't know, so they're going to they're gonna take my overtures as being disrespectful or, 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 or uh, uh, encroaching up on their boundaries. No, no, I'm not telling you to grab a great controversy book and force them to read it. That's not what I'm telling you. I'm telling you, take them out for lunch and leave it at that. I'm telling you to be a sounding board, to be a good listening ear. I'm telling you to simply give them a hug and embrace them with no strings attached. Just don't be annoying. Can you do that? Be nice. Be kind. Don't be judgmental. Can we just do some of the simple things? Right? 
I had a, I had a, a, a reaction to my son this morning. I had a reaction that just, it just came upon me. I was almost old school. I almost wanted to say, boy, you're going to sit. You're going to be bored because I used to be bored, and you're going to be bored too. <laughs> Teach him a lesson. But that's my old school training. Y'all don't know. I'm telling you. I know you look at me and say, you're, you're untraditional. I got an old school person that lives within me and doesn't even pay rent. And I have, to, I have to war against that person sometimes. But I'm telling you, I, I wanted to shut it down. And my son had a reaction to my reaction to him. I saw his face. I, he felt deflated. It was almost like, Dad, you don't, you don't ever come at me like that. And I almost felt like, well, it's the Sabbath. <laughs> and God is holy. And there's some other stuff. Just give me time to think about it. But son, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Because here's the reality, his, his boredom is human nature. And in those moments, I don't need to push away. I just simply need to bring him close and say, you're bored, baby. I know, I know, I know what that's like. What, what would make this a better experience for you? Can we make a deal here? I'll let you have my phone. But can, can, you, can you hang for 10 more minutes and engage? Right? Work something out. I know, I know, I know. Old school parents are like, Pastor, shame on you. But here's the thing. Nobody would watch this. Watch this. That thinking is what has emptied this church out. Some of you have been here long enough to know the glory days. Oh, and everything was full. Everything was full. Where are they now? It's our job to find them. Let's sweep the house. Diligently search. And do whatever it takes. Son, if you want to, you can take my phone right now. It's up to you. If you want to, you're good? I tried. Watch this. We're closing on this. We're closing on this. We're closing on this. Watch this. Watch this. It says, and when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. I have found my lost coin. Gathers her friends, celebrates, everybody celebrates. Jesus says, in the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one, one sinner, one sinner who repents. Think about this for a second. All of heaven stops and celebrates as if there's a championship that's been won. All of, all of heaven stops. All the angels come together and they rejoice over one who repents. What happens when it's two? Oh, what happens when there's three? Oh, what happens when there's five, when there's ten? Man, heaven must never stop partying, right? That's exactly what our goal should be. The angels don't stop singing, they don't stop praising, they don't stop clapping, they don't stop shouting because we keep giving them reason to celebrate. Over one. God loses a coin, but God doesn't lose ownership of the coin. Just because the coin is lost doesn't mean it's no longer God's. I don't know where your family members are. I don't know where you are personally right now. But just because you're lost or you know someone who's lost, don't think that ownership has changed. It's still my lost coin. Hello? It's still my lost Nintendo Switch. Hello? You didn't pay for it just because you found it. It's still mine. God has children out there that are his. Just because they're lost does not mean it changed ownership. And I want to say this to you. We're going to pray. God, did you lose me? Is it your fault? God deems that creating us, that giving us life was worth all the risk. God deems it worth a chance to be loved by us and to love us. God determined that life and all the potential for, for mayhem was worth the chance to be loved by us and for us him to love us. Think about that for a second. He determined that we were worth the risk. Getting to know you was worth the risk.
getting to know me was worth the risk. The question we have to ask ourselves when Christ comes again, will it be worth it? Will it be worth it? I believe that every tear will be wiped away. Every person who said it's so unfair and you lost me, God, you lost me, you lost me, won't be able to ever share those words again when they are found and in his arms forevermore. There's a lot of unjust things that have happened in this world, but I am convinced from Scripture that God will make it up to every last one of you. Every last soul that has ever been harmed, every last soul that has been abused, every last person that life has been unfair, I believe God will make it up to them and he'll never grow tired making it up to them for the rest of eternity. Amen? And I believe that the chorus of those who are redeemed, those who are found and chose to remain will say, yes, Jesus, thank you that I was worth it. Thank you that all of this that you have given to us, it is all worth it. It is all worth it. And Jesus will also look at his nail-scarred hands, and he'll also proclaim, you're worth it. You are worth it. You are worth it. No, Jesus, you did not lose me. You loved me. Father God, thank you so much that you have called us into this place of reckoning. Thank you so much that as we reflect on your foreknowledge of creating life, knowing all of the things that could go wrong, that you saw us and seeing our face, seeing our eyes, hearing our laughter, knowing our personality, that it was too much to pass by, that you saw fit that you had to meet us face to face, that you wanted to be in a loving relationship with us for eternity and not even your fears, not even, not even sin and all that it's, it's darkness could, 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 could cloud the potential and the beauty of being loved by you and us loving you. Thank you for being a romantic God. <laughs> Thank you for your hope. Thank you for never giving up and searching so diligently. Thank you for using a lamp that is the sun that brings so much light into our lives. You've inspired us to do the same. We won't give up. We'll be diligent. We'll sweep and we'll use the lamp, the lamp of Jesus Christ, his character, his love, his word to find every lost coin. Game on. You didn't lose us. You loved us. And now we're going to love in return. Thank you. Jesus' name. Amen.